right, we are continuing the season preview and predictions for all the Big Ten teams. And as you can see from the, the title graphic, we've got Iowa today, a team that I'm pretty high on. So we're going to get into it. If you prefer to listen to this or to, or to view this content through a podcast platform, got you covered. Check the description. You can listen to it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts uh, for free. Uh, make sure you go listen to and download that today and make sure you go subscribe to the Takeover Sports Network on YouTube. So for Iowa, to say that Iowa had a tough season in 2022 would be an understatement. It was tough to watch. Uh, and, and on one hand, they had one of the best defenses in the entire country. One of the most elite, tough-nosed, high-flying defenses you'll see. One that I thought was the best defense in the country and, of course, in the Big Ten Conference. You know, they had riddled, they're riddled with all Big Ten players, with draft picks, with school legends, forces to be reckoned. They had it all on defense at every single level. On the other hand, their offense was the complete opposite. Uh, it was arguably the worst in the entire country. They couldn't establish the run. They couldn't throw the ball. They couldn't pass protect. They couldn't open up run lanes. They had no explosive playability whatsoever. It doesn't mean they didn't have explosive players, which we'll get into in a few minutes. But their offense was inept. It was putrid, and you can blame it because of the quarterback play from Spencer Petrus. You can blame it on the play calling from offense coordinator Brian Ferentz. You can blame it on the offensive line. Whatever it was, it was all awful, right? Everyone can agree with that. I think Iowa fans and coaches would agree with that as well. But going into 2023, I'm fairly high on the Hawkeyes for several reasons. And let me tell you why. So when you look at some of their key additions that they had or, or, or just general reasons to be excited, I'm starting on offense because that's what had to be revamped. And I think they did do that. The new face at quarterback for Iowa, Cade McNamara, is a huge reason as to why I think this offense is going to be turned around. He's a proven winner, right, from Michigan, knows what it takes to drive a team to not just a conference championship, right, but to a playoff spot. Obviously, didn't get over the hump and win a playoff game when he was there, uh, but he knows how to get a team there and be a leader and drive that culture to get there to the highest level when it comes to a conference championship in the Big Ten. I mean, it's a power five Conference, arguably the best conference in the country. It's a big deal. Get your team there and then get to a playoff appearance. He's not going to be a top quarterback in the country, right? Don't confuse this with him putting up C.J. Stroud numbers or Caleb Williams or Drake May numbers or Jake Daniels from LSU. Don't confuse with that. But what he is is he's going to be an efficient game manager and, quite frankly, light years better than anything that, that Iowa had in Spencer Petras. And I'm not trying to dog the kid, but he just wasn't it. And he, he seemed like a good guy, wasn't it for what Iowa needed at quarterback and for the offense. And he's going to have weapons, right? He's bringing his tight end, Eric All from Michigan, who, when he is healthy, is one of the most dynamic tight ends in the country. He is uh, athletic. He can make contested catches. He can make people miss in the open field. He's got it all. And I expect him to be healthy this season. And next to him, you got arguably one of the other best tight ends in the country in Luke Lachey. Luke Lachey was already kind of in line at Iowa to continue that pipeline of great tight ends that go from Iowa and then go to the NFL following in Sam Laporta's footsteps. And Sam Laporta, we all know, was a beast at Iowa and hopefully has a great NFL career as well. Luke Lachey was already in line for that. And now you get, you get Luke Lachey there. Right. And you have Eric all on the other side to take off any kind of pressure of just only having one good tight end. And now you have a quarterback that can throw actually throw him the ball. So those two weapons right there are arguably the best tight end duo in the country. I think there's some others that you can you can maybe make the argument for. Nebraska is a name to keep an eye out for with uh, Eric Gilbert and Thomas Fanoni and Nate Borkircher uh, coming down the line as well, depending on how that kind of wraps in. But these are two guys that are proven. Right. Eric Gilbert's got the talent in Nebraska. Thomas Fedoni's got the talent. These are two proven elite tight ends, uh, or great tight ends at least, that are developing into elite tight ends. So two great weapons for Cade McNamara. When you look at wide receiver, Nico Regini is is one that I think is you should expect his stats to take a jump this season. Um, you know, he he's a guy that has the talent, has the pieces to be a really good receiver in this conference and for Iowa hasn't had necessarily the support at quarterback or the rest of his offense when he's been ready to, when he's been ready to play and, and be there and be that guy early on, maybe when the offense is better when he was a freshman, sophomore, it's a different story. But as he's been in that starting lineup, the offense just hasn't been able to take advantage of his skill set. I expect his numbers to take a jump. Another name, Iowa fans that you've probably seen in the, from the, from the transfer portal, one that I think could be Iowa's number one receiver 
at some point in the season, he's that talented as wide receiver Caleb Brown, the transfer from Ohio State. He has a chance to vault up very quickly and be Iowa's number one receiver. He was a former four-star borderline, five-star receiver. He's got he, so much talent. He can. He's got all the athletic ability in the world to be a difference maker for Iowa's offense. So that's kind of your, your – I know there's others too, but those are your four guys that I think you're going to see the most of. Tight end especially, I'm really excited about see how they get involved in the offense. And then again, Regini and Caleb Brown as well. It all comes back to that quarterback with Cade McNamara. He's going to be a huge difference maker, in my opinion, for this team. And then at running back, Caleb Johnson. Loved the kid last year. 800 yards, six touchdowns as a true freshman in an offense that couldn't throw the ball and had trouble run blocking for him. He still got his as a true freshman. So I, I think you're going to see his numbers take a jump, especially if you get some of that play action game in there with those two dynamic tight ends. If Cade McNamara can make some of those downfield throws, you're going to see lanes open up for him in the running game because it's going to have to breathe a little bit. The defense are going to have to honor the pass a little bit more, which is surprising to say after last season for Iowa. They're going to have to honor it a little more if you get the play action, if you get some of those downfield throws in line. And yes, Iowa fans, I know what you're thinking. What about the offensive line? That's where it all starts. Right. Nothing else can happen. The run game can't go in if the offensive line can't block. The quarterback can't throw if they can't pass protect. I get it. First and foremost, the thing I'm talking directly to you, Iowa fans, right now, you, me, and you, the thing that I want you to understand, George Barnett is one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. That is my opinion. Yes, I said it. What? Crazy. Yes. He's one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. He was my offensive line coach for five years at Miami University in the MAC. He knows how to recruit. He knows how to develop players. He knows how to coach the position. He knows the technique. Do not worry about that aspect. Trust that process. I'm telling you, he knows exactly what he's doing. The outlook for the offensive line is that this group was a very young and inexperienced group that had a lot of new faces playing, getting their first reps, getting their first playing time. And again, it does not help when you have a really, really bad quarterback. I think even with a great offensive line, Spencer Petrus would have been benched on a team that, you know, had the weapons and offensive line around him to protect him and for him to throw to. I still think he would have benched. I think it was that bad, right? There's an aspect of the offensive line not performing well, run, you know, run game, pass catchers, all that. I still think Petrus was a main problem of that offense. And so now this group at offensive line that was young and experienced has had a full fall season where a core group of them are returning. They got a fall season under their belt. They get a winter off season conditioning and strength program. They get a full spring ball, right? Then they get summer lifting and summer, you know, practices that they do in between before comp, fall camp. And then they get fall camp and then they open up their season with a few games where they can warm up a little bit. I think this, potential scenario for the offensive line is similar to that of 2007. And Hawkeye fans, you might remember this. In 2007, the majority of the offensive line for Iowa were underclassmen. Uh, they gave up 46 sacks on the season. The offense averaged about 315 yards per game, and they only uh, averaged three and a half yards per carry. Their offense was terrible in 2007. In 2008, it was completely different. The offense only gave the offensive line only gave up 26 sacks. The offense overall averaged 370 plus yards per game and nearly five yards to carry. And a lot of that is because that core of that offensive line returned and they developed and they and they just matured, right? And they got better. And so when you have that coming in, it's always a good sign when you're coming in with a group that maybe they did struggle, but it's not a group of guys that were, you know, two-year starters already. They're all coming back. And now you're like, okay, well, you're already seniors and you struggled last year as juniors. What are we doing from here? Now you're looking at a young group of guys that maybe weren't ready physically or mentally just yet. And now they get to develop, right? Now they get that offseason to develop. That's always a good sign. That's a scenario I think that is rather likely for Iowa is that offense line to take a huge step forward. And again, you got the, you got the talent to do it and you've certainly got the coaching and George Barnett to do it. I promise you that. Uh, a name to be very excited about for the offense line from the transfer portal, Rusty Feff. Uh, transfer from Miami, Ohio. I played with Rusty for two years at Miami. You should be very excited about him, Iowa fans. He was a four-year starter at Miami. can play any spot on the interior offense line. Two-year starter at center, two-year starter, uh, excuse me, three-year starter at center. No, two-year starter at center, two-year starter at right guard. So uh, four years of starting experience from expect for him to push for starting time at Iowa immediately when he gets there in the summer. And, and he really, he can play anywhere in the interior, like I said. 
All right, let's look at the up opposite side of the ball on defense. The Hawkeyes have to replace quite a bit of talent on defense. I know that's a cause for concern for some Iowa fans, and rightfully so. You replace talent like Lucas Van Ness, Jack Campbell, who were just two studs, Riley Moss, Seth Benson, Kayvon Merriweather. You're replacing some legitimate, I mean, talented football players, guys that are going to go and make a long living in the NFL, and, and rightfully so. But they bring back plenty of talent to match what they had and remain an elite defense in 2023. When you look at their defensive line, first and foremost, they returned seven of the nine rotational players that they had from last season. Their four starters looked to be Deontay Craig, a defensive end, who had seven and a half sacks last season. Noah Shannon and Noah Shannon and Logan Lee, a defensive tackle, with some younger guys pushing them, younger, talented guys pushing them as well. And then Joe Evans, a defensive end. At linebacker, Jay Higgins is the one solo kind of true returner. But the Hawkeyes dipped in the portal a little bit on defense as well. On offense, they made some big splashes. But defense, arguably one of the bigger impacts, maybe this, I would say maybe the second biggest impact when it comes when it all comes through, uh, was Nick Jackson from Virginia. Second team all ACC linebacker. When he gets in the summer, I expect him to push for playing time, if not start fairly quickly uh, as fall camp gets along. And in the secondary, this is where you get some more stability. Maybe defensive line and secondary, the two of the more stable spots, linebackers, where you have some more questions. They return an absolute stud in Cooper DeGene, who was already pre being projected as a first-round pick in 2024. We played a little bit of corner, a little bit of that hybrid spot for Iowa. Expect him to be a stud. He's joined by a few others in Quinn Schultz and Sebastian Castro and others in that backfield. And, and through all this, the defense, and I spent less time on the defense because I guess the point through all this with the defense is that – I don't have any questions or concerns about Iowa's defense in 2023. Maybe do I think they might not end up being statistically top three in some places like they were last season? Sure, that's a possibility. Do I think, do I have any fear of them not being a top 15 unit in the entire country and arguably the best defense in the Big Ten Conference? No, I don't. I have the utmost confidence that they're going to be a top 15 defense in the country. They're going to be a game changer, right? If you're a if you're a uh, number 40 ranked defense in the country, you're not going to be necessarily a liability against teams unless you play a really high powered offense. Maybe that's where you kind of get exposed, but you're not going to be a game changer, right? I expect the Iowa Hawkeyes defense again to be a game changer and a game wrecker on defense in 2023. No questions about that. They have too much talent, too much stability at all levels of the field, too much culture there that is one to be reckoned with going into 2023. And again, I expect them to arguably be the best defense in, in the conference, just depending on how Michigan specifically and Penn State, I know that's kind of interesting to hear about, but Penn State's defense, a lot of talent returning, depending on those two shake up uh, for best defense in the, con in the conference. Excuse me. So when we look at their schedule, right, 2023 is a year for Iowa where I do think that they have the potential to win the Big Ten West. And let's go through this. So first game, they start off Utah State at home. No issues with that. They're going to roll in that game. They play at Iowa State. I'm giving them a win there. Western Michigan for week three. I think they roll the MAC team there. Week four is where things get a little difficult. They have to play at Penn State. And Penn State is a team that I will cover in, in future videos. Penn State's a team that has elite talent at nearly every level on their team. They've got elite offensive linemen. They've got a deep receiver core. They've got arguably the best running back duo in the country. They've got a high-powered, uh, you know, potential high-powered quarterback in Drew Aller, Theo Johnson at tight end, and then linebacker core that many people would dream of secondary. They've, they've got it all. And so if this game was at Iowa, I'd consider it a little differently. But it's at Penn State. It's, it's a little bit in the season. I know it's still early on, but it's a little bit in the season where Penn State can settle in a little bit. I think Iowa loses that game, but for the matter of the Big Ten West innings, it's not going to affect much. Uh, week five, I think they beat Michigan State, who I think is going to take another big dip this season. Purdue, I think they get the win against. I like Hudson Card at Purdue, but I think Purdue is going to be quite a different team without Aiden O'Connell, without Charlie Jones, without Jalen Graham. When you get to Wisconsin, at Wisconsin, this is where it's a really difficult game for me to predict. And some people would argue Iowa win that game because of somewhat stability in terms of coaching staff. Yes, they added a lot in the transfer portal, but they return a lot of their core. Wisconsin is a team where you have a new coaching staff from Luke Fickle. You have a new quarterback in Tanner Mordecai where 
obviously Cade McNamara is a new quarterback, but the offense for Wisconsin is going to change so significantly. You could see it taking a little long. I don't see it being the case. I think Wisconsin wins this game and ends up being the Big Ten West winner. But that does not mean I think it's a clear line. This is a 50-50 toss-up for me where if it was at home for Iowa, I'd probably pick Iowa. And depending on how Iowa's playing those first that first half of the season, I could absolutely see them winning this game. I think they beat Minnesota, beat Northwestern, uh, beat Rutgers, beat Illinois, and then finally uh, beat Nebraska. Now, Nebraska is a team to look out for. In my previous video, I had them going 8-4, and four, again, losing to Iowa. But if Nebraska is rolling with all that talent, specifically at quarterback with Jeff Sims, and if Matt Rule's culture really takes forth, then watch out because they could be a dangerous team in the Big Ten West here. Maybe not vying for the division title, but a team that can play spoiler if Iowa is in that position. And again, if they go 10 and two and they, and they lose to Wisconsin, right. And they lose to Penn state, they could still win the big 10 West depending on how, depending on how it shakes up with Wisconsin. I see this division as a two horse race between Iowa and Wisconsin. And that's not to say that this record 10 and two would uh, keep them from, you know, winning the big 10 West in this whole scenario though, I do have Wisconsin only losing one game to Ohio state, which I'll cover Wisconsin in other video. So, this is my record for Iowa. Let me know in the comments, do you think this is good? Let me know specifically what you think about Penn State, because I know Wisconsin, it could be a bit of a toss-up, but let me know if you think I'm too high on Penn State. If, if Iowa's got that game in the bag, Hawkeye fans, let me know what you think. Uh, but So in, in the end for Iowa, I have them at 10-2, second in the Big Ten West, but could see them winning it all if they beat Wisconsin or just depending on how Wisconsin season turns out for them. So but again, let me know in the comments what you think. Make sure you go subscribe to the Takeover Sports Network on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at DonnieMac98. Again, if you prefer this show in podcast or audio form, click the description on this video for the links to not just all of our Twitter handles, but to the link for Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you can go and download it and listen for free for the podcast version. For the network and for the show, I am Donovan White, and I will see you all next time.